I'm going to stick with the remit I was given, which was to focus very much on Irish publications and uh, also on our Irish guidelines. So if we look at um, the publications mentioned above, these are really key to the whole um, management of postpartum hemorrhage. First of all, obviously you're aware of the confidential inquiry, and it does show that death from hemorrhage is falling uh, as we go along, which is a really good um, sign of what we're doing. Um, but still there's substandard care in about 60% of cases and the three areas that were identified that we are poor at are um, recognising uh, or treating uterine atony, um, recognising intra-abdominal bleeding and our management of um, the morbidly adherent placenta. So that's the UK and Northern Irish report. And then obviously we began accruing data uh, about maternal deaths via, via a confidential inquiry and we have had the first publication of that data, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I've always been very interested in uh, the audit of severe maternal morbidity because it obviously is the iceberg beneath the tip and there are lessons that we can learn from that that are um, as valid or sometimes even more valid than the confidential death inquiries. And the Scottish audit has always greatly impressed me. Um, we began auditing with the National Perinatal Epidemiology Centre here. We began a national audit of severe maternal morbidity, which has also recently been published. And then we have the guideline, which has just been updated about the prevention and management of primary PPH. I should state that the lead author on that is Professor Deirdre Murphy. Um, so it wasn't myself. I'm not going to take credit for a guideline that I didn't produce. Um, okay. So the purpose of the talk, we're going to establish the clinical significance of postpartum hemorrhage in an Irish context, talk about the definition of postpartum hemorrhage, uh, how we recognise it, appropriate clinical management of it, team working and quality standards. So first of all, the Irish uh, maternal death inquiry, uh, the key findings, this is in the years 2009 to 2011, and there were 18 deaths reported. This gives us a rate of about 8.4 per 100,000, which is akin to what is reported in the UK. And it's of interest that our central statistics office simultaneously reports a, a death rate of 4 per 100,000. So we've probably always been underestimating our maternal mortality. So it's good that we now have a more realistic figure. And as you all know, direct deaths um, constitute about a third, but an awful lot are indirect deaths. So that's another day's talk. In the uh, direct causes, um, uh, thromboembolic disease features prominently. And just in terms of hemorrhage, there just were two cases of major hemorrhage, and they were attributable to amniotic fluid embolism and uterine rupture. So looking at the morbidity, this is the, the publication of the uh, National Perinatal D uh, Epidemiology Centre data of severe maternal morbidity, uh, again, um, 2011. Um, we have a rate, so there are 260 women identified as su having suffered a severe event, and I'll show you the definitions of those in a minute. Major obstetric hemorrhage constitutes the vast majority of them, 2.3 per thousand. When we defined obstetric, major obstetric hemorrhage, it was a bleed of two and a half litres or more or a transfusion of five units of blood or more or treatment of coagulopathy. So it is a fairly significant bleed. And these were the morbidity rates. There's data there from 2011 and also 2012. And you can see the leading cause is major obstetric hemorrhage. So it is our leading problem in terms of severe maternal morbidity. Um, I suppose of interest there, our peripartum hysterectomy rate is about 0.3 per thousand, which is uh, quite reasonable. Um, I suppose of interest is we've sepsis here somewhere. But it's very, we have a very low rate of it uh, because we've used very strict criteria. We've only been using septicemic shock. And that has actually stemmed from the whole um, problem that Michael has highlighted, that um, it's actually very diff difficult to uh, define sepsis. Um, I suppose one of the things that's good about um, the national data is that we have these box plots and all the units in Ireland are plotted along these lines. Uh, this, this line here is the number of deliveries per unit. So that helps you guess roughly where your units should lie. But all of us probably should know where our unit lies in this, in this box plot. But we can look at all the outliers. So the outliers need to look at themselves carefully. Um, what were the causes? This is of major obstetric hemorrhage. Now, we're not just talking about postpartum hemorrhage, but the leading cause there is uterine atony, and you can see that retained placental membranes come in as quite an important factor as well. 
Um, we see a morbidly adherent placenta at about 9.6%, and then we have all the other various causes that you're aware of. I suppose one thing that's interesting there as well is what percentage are delivered by cesarean section. And 60% of the uterine acne cases are delivered by cesarean section, so we need to be very alert to bleeding post-section as well, or you know, uterine acne post-section. Um, and all the cases there of bleeding from uterine incision. We had a quite a high rate of bleeding from a uterine incision there, actually. This is a nice work that was done by Jennifer Lutomsky um, and was published in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynaecology in 2012, actually. And it looks at temporal trends in postpartum hemorrhage in Ireland uh, from, two, from 1999 to 2009. So over this 11-year period, the top line represents total postpartum hemorrhage rates. So in fact, the postpartum hemorrhage rates in Ireland um, increased more than threefold over this 11-year period. And with hype data, you're only able to break them down a certain amount, but the major part of the trend was actually uterine acne. And when we looked at why this was happening, there wasn't a change in uterotonic administration in the different units over that time period. Um, and all of these uh, rates have increased no matter what way the woman was del delivered, either vaginally or either by operative vaginal delivery or by caesarean section. So um, it's a problem that goes across all modes of delivery. Um, it also may be a case that we're better at reporting it, and maybe this has affected the trend. But one thing that is of interest is that these trends have all also been um, recorded and published in the USA, Canada, and other high-income countries. So it is not just something that's peculiar to Ireland. Um, I suppose if we just look at the definition of postpartum hemorrhage, it's actually fraught with difficulty. Um, in that obviously we have primary, which is within the first 24 hours, and we have secondary, which is after 24 hours. We have more than 500 mils after vaginal birth. Um, we have the Americans you ha saying that more uh, than a litre after caesarean section is a postpartum hemorrhage. We have the Australians saying that more than 750 mils is a PPH after caesarean section. Um, more than a litre is significant, and more than 2.5 litres major. In the Irish guideline, we talk about minor, which is 500 to a litre, major, more than a litre, and then major is divided into moderate, which is a litre to two litres, or severe, which is more than two litres. So you can take your pick. Um, the reason, I suppose, the definition is important is that it's important for research, and it's important if we're trying to compare or we're trying to find out reasons why um, there are problems in various areas or are we managing things appropriately. However, at the end of the day, as clinicians, as you all know, is I don't really care what the definition is. I know it when I see it. Now. So uh, the key things, I suppose, about postpartum hemorrhage are preventing it, recognising it, and appropriately intervening. If we look at prevention, um, these, there are antenatal risk factors. So there are risk factors that a woman may have before she has her baby. And these are things that we should be alert to when the woman's booking and throughout her pregnancy. And first of all, being on top of any anemia and then um, putting a care plan in the chart for any of these risk factors. Uh, women at risk of postpartum hemorrhage, it is uh, common sense. They should be delivered in a unit with access to blood. All women with a history of caesarean section should have ultrasound identification of the location of the placenta. And when placenta accreta or procreta is suspected, there should be multidisciplinary planning of the delivery in the most appropriate site with access to the most appropriate personnel and facilities. Also, there are intrapartum risk factors, so we need to be alert to, the, to these when we're managing the woman in the labour ward. So these various um, risk factors are things you're all aware of and you have to be on top of those. There is no doubt from the literature and from um, systematic reviews that active management of the third stage of labour reduces postpartum hemorrhage. That involves prophylactic oxytocin, cord clamping, and um, controlled cord traction. Prophylactic oxytocin, um, the evidence does support oxytocin in this regard over ergometrine. And then if you have high-risk patients, the syntocin infusion, 40 units and 500 mils of normal saline over four hours. Let's have a look at recognition. Um, we know that we have been poor in the past at identifying 
it's particularly the volume of blood loss. There are things that can assist us in this regard, calibrated vaginal drape markings, transparent plastic collection bags, and some units have those, I know, um, weighing particularly in theatre, weighing all the swabs, and staff training. In our hemorrhage drills, we've often mocked up blood loss, so we've created volumes of what looks like blood and pour them over various things such as um, um, liners, etc., and ask staff to estimate how much blood loss there is. And it's always very interesting to see how inaccurate we can be. But certainly people go away from the drill with the clear, clearer idea of volume of blood loss. We know that the pregnant woman is very adapted to, she's physiologically adapted to compensate for bleeding. So in fact she's got to have lost about a litre to a litre and a half before she starts showing any clinical changes in her vital signs. Um, so we have to be alert to that and um, certainly she's usually lost quite a bit when her systolic blood pressure is a lower or her pulse rate is, is higher than her systolic blood pressure. One of the areas that's um, particularly difficult is identifying the occult bleeding, the intra-abdominal bleeding, and this is a picture of an early warning score. Uh, um, but this was a, a, a study done in, uh, in the Journal of Anesthesia in 2012, and this was looking at matern maternity early warning scores, just seeing how they functioned. So, of 676 obstetric admissions, 200 triggered a response. So they do trigger a lot, which I think is, a, you know, is very important if we're thinking of them. Their se the sensitivity for picking up pathology in this study was about 90% with a specificity of 80%. So they're not a perfect tool, and Michael will acknowledge that as well. And that's why we have to still have our clinical nose uh, to the wind. Um, but it's just important that these are standardised further and studied more so that we can make sure that they're appropriate for the patient population that we have. Early appropriate intervention. Well, once a postpartum hemorrhage is recognised, there's a whole load of things we've got to do. We've got to communicate, we've got to resuscitate, we've got to monitor response to our treatment, we've got to investigate the underlying cause of bleeding and stop it. And all must be taken, undertaken simultaneously. Um, there is a large degree of teamwork in this. You're going to have a talk later on about teamwork, and I will touch upon it towards the end. So we want to call for help. And these are the people we want to call and we want to alert our backup facilities and very importantly try and assign someone to document and communicate. So the key principles of initial management are assessment of the patient, resuscitation and stop the bleeding. We want to look at the vital signs, the airway breathing circulation, the extent of the bleeding, the cause of the bleeding and the blood investigations. Components of resuscitation lie the woman flat, ensure the airway uh, is clear and that she's breathing, administer oxygen, establish two large intravenous cannulas, send off blood for cross match, a full blood count, clotting screen is very important at this point and sometimes forgotten, baseline renal function tests and liver function tests, put in your, your Foley catheter and have crept into monitoring response there already. Volume replacement is very important. Crystalloid or colloid um, to a maximum of 3.5 litres. Um, we don't wish to give any more than that. Our big um, issue is that we're trying to restore circulating volume, we're trying to avoid acidosis, and we're trying to avoid hypovolemia. Um, both, uh, these will dilute uh, your clotting factors and um, cause coagulopathy and they're not oxygen carriers. There is recent concern about colloid um, because not only has it a dilutional effect but it may have a direct effect on coagulation so we need to be cautious in its use in terms of preventing coagulopathy. Blood, preferably cross-matched but o is negative or group specific depending on what time frame you're working under. And the blood products, now in the guideline you would say fresh frozen plasma if your coagulation is more than 1.5 times prolonged or you could have four units of fresh frozen plasma ordered for every six of red cells that you use. Fibrinogen, we're, to, we're recommending it when the fibrinogen level falls below 1.5 and platelets if the platelets are falling less than 50. Now, um, I cannot emphasize enough that the blood product administration should be guided by the clinical picture and not by blood tests alone because as you are aware there's a time lapse between what you're doing and when you get your blood tests and you do sometimes need to be proactive about what you're giving and anticipate rather than wait for them. 
And it's very, very important to keep the fluids and the patient warm because that prevents um, coagulopathy and acidosis. So stopping the bleeding, you're familiar with this. I'm just going to go through it quickly. Massaging the uterus, putting in your catheter, giving a bolus of syntocin, five units IV, giving your ergometrine, which is 500 micrograms IV or IM. Contraindication in people who are hypertensive. Syntocin infusion, 40 units. Carboprost. Carboprost intramyometrially is a possibility. And misoprostol. Now the guideline does recommend misoprostol, 600 micrograms, um, orally or sublingually. Um, obviously, people give misoprostol in different ways, but this was based on the FIGO guidelines. And very, very important, if you are falling behind or you're getting slow response to treatment, you've got to do an examination under anesthesia. There, you cannot highlight enough how important that is. And the things that you're looking for are tone. These are the four T's again, which you should all be familiar with, but always be rechecking them in your mind. Is the uterus contracting in response to what you're giving? Is there any tissue retained? So a careful examination of the uterine cavity. Is there any trauma, any cervical tears, any um, vaginal tears? And lastly, thrombin. So if you've gone through all of the three T's, and, or the first three T's, and you still cannot explain the degree of bleeding, that's at the point where you're looking back for your coagulopathy results that were taken initially. Um, and if they haven't been taken clinically, you can tell that there's coagulopathy, obviously, clinically, if there's not, no clotting and blood is coming out. Um, again, we're monitoring then and investigating what exa how things are going on after the initial resuscitation. The surgical management, I've, I've called this advanced, but in fact the balloon tamponade, tamponade is not really an advanced surgical management. Um, the B lynch suture, uterine devascularization, internal iliac artery ligation, hysterectomy, abdominal packing, interventional radiology. I'm just going to touch briefly upon those. In the coom, we use the Rouche balloon, which is a balloon designed for uh, stopping bleeding uh, from the bladder after surgery. This is another balloon, the Cook balloon, probably has some more advantages in that it doesn't contain latex and it has a drainage port. You're all familiar with it. You, you obviously have to do an EUA first to make sure that your uterus is clear of tissue. Um, ultrasound is also very important or helpful in terms of placing it and making sure that you've inflated it correctly and that there's no bleeding behind it. The B Lynch suture, um, uh, described not that long ago, actually has been shown to be very, very effective. We could talk about all these different interventions for quite a period of time, but I'm not going to. But the key thing about this is to pace, place the patient in lithotomy, exteriorize the uterus, manually compress it. If it's responding to manual compression, it'll respond to a B Lynch. And there are lots of different variations on the theme in the literature and anecdotally. So whatever kind of compression suture um, you use, it's as effective as a B Lynch. Internal iliac lig um, artery ligation um, obviously is something for people who are, um, uh, do a lot of gyne gynecological surgery, I think. So you identify the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. And obviously there are a lot of um, things out there that you don't want to damage. So obviously the better skilled the surgeon is, um, the better off you are. Hysterectomy. Um, na worldwide in the literature, hysterectomy rates from about, race range from about 0.24 to 1.4 per thousand. So the Irish rate actually comes in um, at a very reasonable level. Obviously, after the Lourdes Hospital inquiry, there probably was a bit of a backlash with people very reluctant to perform hysterectomy. However, most groups would recommend that early rather than late hysterectomy when you're uh, dealing with quite severe postpartum hemorrhage is actually quite a good way to manage patients. Um, and obviously, currently, discussion with another colleague or having other people involved in the decision is very important. This was just um, anecdotal um, um, information about Irish uh, placenta accreta, but we know cesarean section rates are increasing, we know placenta accreta is increasing, um, and this is showing uh, the Dublin Maternity Hospitals, this is a nice study done by Karen Flood, um, which showed that, just comparing these two time frames, now it's not all, all that relevant, but it is of interest in terms of our cesarean section rate, it's gone from 6% to 19% between these two time frames. And um, peripartum hysterectomy, in fact, has fallen, which is interesting. It's probably a cultural reflection more than anything else. But placenta accreta accounted for 5.4% of cases in this time frame. 
and actually accounts for almost 50% of our, our hysterectomies now. Let's just have a look at, in the, this is the, these are the major obstetric hemorrhages, so they're not all PPHs. Um, but this was what was happening nationally in terms of the uterotonics that we were using in these major bleeders. So, uh, and then we can compare it also with the Scottish uh, data um, to see what our uterotonic response is like. So we're, we, we're using syntocinin as a bolus quite frequently, uh, similar to the Scottish. We're using our syntocinin infusion a lot, which is good. Um, ergometrine. Um, the, the, it was used in 55% of cases of the Scot Scottish, and we're close to that, but we're using it either on its own or we're using it uh, in a combination with oxytocin. Our carboprostrates are very similar, and then we have this little outlier here where we're using misoprostol in about 80% of cases of major postpartum hemorrhage compared to 20% in Scotland. Um, it's also possible from the National Audit to see what sequence, now I haven't looked at that, but what sequence people are giving these uterotonics. One thing that would be clear from the evidence that is available is that misoprostol does not have every, any advantage over the standard uterotonics that we use. So we, there is a tendency for people to be using it earlier on and certainly giving it before ergometrine and that probably is not appropriate. Certainly from the confidential inquiries into maternal deaths in the UK, there were a high percentage of women who did not get ergometrine who died from hemorrhage and that was considered to be quite substandard. Let's see what we're doing surgically. Um, we're very fond of the balloon now. Um, sorry, these are the numbers um, and percentage of the total that had these different interventions. And these are the numbers of these that ended up um, having a peripartum hysterectomy. These are the Scottish data in terms of percentages that had these um, interventions, just for comparison. So almost 30% of the cases um, had a balloon and 22% uh, manual removal of the tissue. So in the vast majority of unanticipated um, obstetric hemorrhage or major obstetric hemorrhage, if you can be aggressive, recognize it, be aggressive with your uterotonics, bring the patient to theatre early for an EUA, insert, remove a tissue, insert your balloon and, and um, correct trauma, you'll actually sort out about 50% of these cases. So really, that's the kind of gist of most of the talk, really. Um, let's have a look at our hysterectomy rate. About, um, where is that? I can't say. Yeah, 30, about 14% of our cases are ending up with hysterectomy. And I didn't mention interventional radiology, but we have a very low rate of that. Um, but it's not that much different from Scotland, from Scotland either, so our access to it is not um, optimal. This was just um, of interest. This was a, pu a publication from the COOM that we did in 2012, and it was looking at fibrinogen. Effectively, in 2009, the Irish Blood Transfusion Service made a decision to replace cryoprecipitate with concentrated fibrinogen. And they did this because there was less um, uh, infectious risk um, with concentrated fibrinogen. So, in fact, we're one of the few countries that actually use fibrinogen um, solely at this point. And what we did was we're, we're all the time we're accruing data about major obstetric hemorrhage in the Croom. And what we did was we looked at people who got, had a major obstetric hemorrhage and got cryoprecipitate to replace their fibrinogen, became hypofibrinogenemic, should I say, required uh, fibrinogen replacement and they either got cryoprecipitate before it came off the shelf or they got fibrinogen. And one of the things we showed, which was quite good, is there is a slight trend of less red cell concentrate um, and less octoplase use in women who had the fibrinogen concentrate, although it's not statistically significant because these numbers are small. But we also showed a very nice dose response curve with fibrinogen, much better than cryoprecipitate. So this is uh, very good data because it's the kind of first clinical data of fibrinogen concentrate use in major obstetric hemorrhage almost in the world. But it, 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 at least it's reassuring to clinicians on the ground that the fibrinogen concentrate is um, replacing the cryoprecipitate more than adequately and there wasn't any adverse effects with its use. Um, on the ground, um, obviously we have the guideline now and each unit should have a protocol for management of PPH. Training of staff is very important, rehearsals and fire drills and we run regular obstetric uh, or emergency courses at the Coombe to try and 
uh, keep all this information going, keeping the multidisciplinary approach going. Um, you need senior staff involvement and um, I think one thing I would say over the years is that there is sometimes an issue with people who are um, in their career quite a long time uh, coming towards the end of their career, they're very reluctant to, to join the drills and in terms, sometimes feel that they're going to be exposed, um, which is terribly inappropriate because, in fact, there's a huge amount of learning that goes on in them and uh, there's a huge exchange of information. So often we have cases, people will, will just have discussions and people will mention about cases they saw in whatever year or whatever uh, that such and such and such happened during it and always there's something to be learnt. We have emergency postpartum hemorrhage boxes on our, all our wards. Uh, this has everything in it to uh, perform the initial steps of resuscitation, etc. And this is very important. This little guy is our, he's our motto or our, our little icon for our hemorrhage drills at the Coombe. And I call him Mo, which is really cute, uh, for major obstetric hemorrhage. But I use this visually because when you think about postpartum hemorrhage, you cannot manage it by yourself. So we've got someone up at the head area managing the airway, lying flat, administering oxygen. We've, someone, we've got to allocate someone to establish the circulation, to give fluids, bloods, drugs. We've someone down the lower end managing the uterus, placing a catheter, sometimes giving uterotonics tonics down there. We've someone calling for help, communicating, recording, and evaluating. So it, as I often say, it's like a rugby team Brian O'Driscoll might be the best, or was the best, uh, number 13 in the world, but he's absolutely useless if nobody passes him the ball or if he doesn't pass the ball. So even though you may know every single thing there is to know about postpartum hemorrhage, you are no good unless you're working in a team. And you're going to learn about teamwork later on today as well from Neve Hayes, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Mm -hmm. Documentation is very important, and these are the things that we need to document. Who arrives, when they arrive, the sequence of events, what's given and the condition of the mother. Care following the event is very important. So I suppose um, Michael touched on this as well. There's a great tendency when we deliver the baby to say, oh, that's great. Um, but in fact, we need to be very vigilant after the event, close monitoring, high, high dependency or ICU setting, still maintain your multidisciplinary input, care of the newborn is important. Thromboprophylaxis is very important um, because our our, we often have a tendency not to give something um, that's going to uh, anticoagulate the blood if we've just seen an awful lot of blood. So we also have to remember that once hemostasis is achieved, that we should start thromboprophylaxis approximately four to six hours later. Um, debriefing is very important, not just for the, the, the relatives and the patient, but also for the staff, because these are quite traumatic cases occasionally, and clinical incident reporting. So quality, things that we can look at uh, in our own units and nationally, monitor all our cases, documentation, did we take appropriate care, notify things to risk management, regular training of teams. So women at increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage should be identified and a care plan put in place. Their management in, uh, involves these different parameters and good teamwork is essential. So looking forward, Postpartum hemorrhage rates are increasing, so that is really important that we realise that. We're delivering more complex patients, our caesarean section rates are going up, our percent of creatures are going up. We need multidisciplinary planning for delivery, particularly for the more complex placental accretas. We need to recognise the signs and symptoms of hemorrhage, call for help, work as a cohesive team to resuscitate the patient and stop the bleeding. And if you do only one thing when you return to your unit, I was laughing at this because I've actually suggested two things. A uh, set of sporadic hemorrhage drills um, and in a very relaxed, uh, interactive environment and you'd be amazed at how much you can learn from them. And also, um, you, uh, you're reporting these cases of severe hemorrhage um, to the NPEC uh, at, all de at this time, but if you analyse cases as a group, and I know a lot of people do this routinely, but it's very important to kind of break it down and see what things you did and you could always have done something better generally and it's always very good to have a look at that. Okay, thank you very much.